Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I don't know what you said in the introduction, but I'm sure it was very good. Um, so I'm pleased to share my story with you uh, today. I'm going to tell you about an invention that I made and some of the problems that we were trying to overcome with this invention, or I was trying to overcome with this invention, and some of the challenges along the way and what's happened since then. When I was six years old in this photograph, I had an image in my head of what I wanted to do. I kind of asked myself a question of why I was here on earth, and the answer was to solve a big problem, but I had no idea what that problem was. So I looked for that problem for the first, until I was 23 years old, and then I read something in a newspaper and it changed my life. This was back in 1984 when I read the newspaper article, and since then, actually these slides are in the wrong order. Let's just see what else is on. Let's just make it up as it is here. Since then we've discovered how big this problem is. This is an example of it, it's to do with injections and syringes. And here's a photograph that I took in Indonesia of children playing in the coffee break between classes. And you can see that they're squirting water at each other and they're doing it by using syringes which they buy from a toy seller who you can see at the back there. And these syringes are used syringes. They have blood in them and mess because they've been picked up off the street and sold to these children. So they're playing with unsafe medical equipment, but also they're drinking from them because it's hot and squirting this water into their mouth. These children are recycling medical waste and they supply people like the schools with them. This was taken in Pakistan and you can see in their hands that they've got syringes which are very valuable for them because they can wash them, quote unquote, and then sell them back at the market. And in both these cases, the syringes are about twice the price of a normal syringe in sterile packaging that you would get from a pharmacy. The actual problem is a lot more organized than I've just described. The reuse of syringes results in 1.3 million deaths a year because of, the, because of reusing equipment by medical practitioners. Because essentially drugs are very profitable and syringes aren't, there's always drugs in locations around the world where they're needed, but there's never enough syringes available because just logistically it isn't worth paying the same attention than it is to get the drugs to the marketplace. So we find often that the people that, that we meet are under enormous pressure to deliver injections, but they just simply don't have the right amount of equipment to do it. There's a bottle of Coca-Cola here, and I'm going to tell you a quick story. But first of all, if you imagine a straw that comes with a Coca-Cola, and you imagine when you order a Coca-Cola or a Fanta or something, you will have it opened at the table in front of you. That's because the staff are showing you that this is a fresh bottle and it's for you because you're paying for it. But in many, many cases, there's a trick that the doctors and nurses play. <coughs> I was in Tanzania and watching injections take place in a clinic and a lovely, uh, very smart lady turned up uh, got off the bus and she had a, a babe in her arms and she went in to see the doctor and we were fascinated by this woman because she was wearing better clothing than all the other people that we had watched go through this procedure. So we kind of thought maybe she had a little bit more status even though she arrived on a bus. She went in and there's a dirty table with two boxes on. One box with some clean syringes in and the doctor said to her, would you like one of these? Because they're around in the local currency, 10 US cents. Or from the other box, would you like one of these? And they were dirty. 
She chose the ones that had blood on to inject her child. And although at the time I was very confused and I couldn't work out what was going on, I was, I was absolutely shocked, of course. I couldn't react in time. The following day we brought that clinic several thousand syringes and downloaded and got a lot more information about what, had what we had witnessed taking place. And it allowed me, with many years of work, to come to a very important conclusion. Number one, every mother loves their child exactly the same regardless of what country that you come from. And as a father and a parent myself, I know very well how deep that love is and you would never want to harm your child. And number two, that woman made a choice, a conscious choice, but she made the wrong choice for several reasons. One, she didn't know that the syringe had to be clean for every single injection because she trusted the doctor to give her a valid choice. That choice before her, she thought, was about saving a few pennies. And hence we watch this very unsafe injection and that's what occurs many hundreds of times a day, a minute, around the world and leads to this incredible number that 1.3 million people die every year because of the reuse of syringes. <clears throat> what kills them, of course, is transmitting viruses from one patient to the other, such as HIV or hepatitis. Now, you may immediately draw the conclusion that this is a money problem, and you're pr partly right. But to the customer, who, if they're informed, should make the right choice, the statistics are very simple. A bottle of Coca-Cola, which in every country of the world I've been to, in 68 developing world countries in the last 10 years, I've seen Coca-Cola available in every single country. And that costs around 50 cents to a dollar. And a syringe, which should be available, is around 5 cents to buy a sterile syringe. So that lady made a choice of uh, a tenth of a Coca-Cola to, to endanger her life, uh, the life of her baby. It was very interesting because even though we're in shock, we watched her walk across the road and while she was waiting for the bus to go back, to her village, there was a drink seller, and she actually took out money and bought a Fanta orange drink and shared it with her child. So she had money in her pocket, but she didn't have the right information in her brain to make the right choice. So I invented this syringe, and this is called K1. It took me uh, about three years to come up with the right invention. These slides are very odd. The, the invention I decided that would make the, the most effect in the world was one that could be made on existing machinery. There are several hundred syringe manufacturers around the world. And if I was going to say to them, we want you to make this design to stop the syringe being used more than once, and it was complicated, that would stop it completely. It had to be very simple. It also had to be made for the same price and it also had to be used in the same way because these were the three barriers that I kept seeing and they were the ones that I wanted to put into my design. And I know at the back you probably can't see this but this is one of our syringes and it looks exactly the same as a normal syringe. You load it with a drug, you tap it, you get the air to the top, you adjust the dose, you give the injection and then if you try and reuse it the plunger breaks inside and leaves the rubber stopper at the end and it can't be used again. It was approved by the World Health Organization and we sell to UNICEF and since we started we've been able to supply around 9 billion, 9,000 million, 9 billion of these products to organizations like UNICEF primarily for immunization and that program, that supply has stopped uh, many tens of millions of fatal infections and we've been very grateful to learn that we've saved around 15 million lives over the last 10 years by producing this product. That wasn't the end of it though because 
the, if, as I mentioned, the information in that lady's mind or brain was the wrong information. So I started a UK charity called Safe Point, and we uh, made a campaign called Lifesaver, where we campaigned against the World Health Organization, uh, asking them to set a new standard, recommending that all syringes in the world become safety syringes like this one, uh, because it was absolutely possible to make them for the right, uh, with the right economic uh, fulfillment. And in 2015, the World Health Organization agreed under certain conditions that we give the manufacturers enough time to change over to this system, which we've done. But also, believe it or not, the World Health Organization said, we'll support you, but your patents have to have expired by the time the law is approved, because otherwise you'll be making money out of this uh, recommendation which was horrific. We would have definitely given up the money had we been able to have that option, but we weren't. Uh, next year, in 2020, this recommendation comes into effect and several manufacturers around the world and about 60 ministries of health have agreed to comply with this and in, I'm sure it's going to grow and, and uh, gather pace. I'm frightened to push the clicker to see what the next slide is. Um, as I mentioned, they're out of order, and this is a, an undercover film which I can show you uh, with, where a nurse is reusing, an, a, in a nice white uniform, she picks the syringe off the tray, it's not in a packet, um, just to illustrate the problem, she injects this four-year-old girl, this was taken undercover for us in Tanzania, after the injection, she puts the syringe back on the tray and the next patient is an 18-year-old who's HIV positive and in this case being treated for uh, syphilis, a sexually translated, uh, transmitted disease. The syringe is so blunt it's difficult to go in the skin. That happens. The more you use a needle, the blunter it gets. And after this injection, HIV, remember, the syringe goes back on the tray and you'll notice it rolls to the left a little bit. The next patient is a baby and she picks that syringe up from that left hand position, prepares the injection and injects the baby. The mother doesn't know, so how can the mother intervene and say stop, I want to uh, get involved here. And we've seen many other cases, again I apologise for it being out of order, in Cambodia, uh, a valley of 2,000 people had 300 HIV patients suddenly appear in a three month period. And one of them was this lady here holding her medicines and Ebola has been proven, the first outbreak of Ebola, Ebola in 1976 was proven to come from there. And this is Margaret Chan, who I negotiated the, um, the breakthrough for. Now, one of the things we were challenged with on the breakthrough was to make an economic case. And after working with the World Health Organization for several years, we were able to come up with this number that for every dollar spent in the future on safe injections, $14 would be saved in not treating diseases that would have come by having unsafe syringes in the system, 2020 I mentioned. And just to finish off, um, I've designed a new product now called Appyject. Uh, I sold it to an American group last year and it's a much more efficient way of giving injections. For the 35 years, because I started in 1984, for the 35 years I've been working in this uh, industry, I've always noticed several outpoints that no one was addressing. I'll give you one example. Glass vials, the small glass vials with the rubber stopper in, which the vaccines are packaged in, are the technology for making those is around 150 years old. And to order a glass vial now, which you have to order in millions, is about a six month waiting list because the process is so slow. And it's a process which uh, literally uh, takes months to produce the glass vial, but also uses so much energy. 
you have to heat the glass vial up to over a thousand degrees centigrade more than 10 times to shape it and form it into that exact uh, shape that is used for a vaccine vial. So I've designed uh, a new system which uses a small plastic blister, which uses a lot less plastic than a syringe. There's no glass involved. Environmentally, it's a fantastic opportunity and win. And I've attached a needle to this blister. And the blister looks like the ones that you get the small uh, eye drops in, which is made by an incredible process which has been around for 60 years. And I've taken the opportunity of combining my experience with theirs, and we've made this incredible advance. It's not on the market yet, but we've got fantastic interest, again, from the World Health Organization and UNICEF, uh, the American government, and many other organizations around the world. And I'm working hard with my new purchaser on that, and we believe we'll launch that in about two years' time.